Good evening. Welcome to our worship this fourth Wednesday in Lent. I hope you've had a chance to download the bulletin from our website. If you haven't had a chance, just jump over there, pause this real quick and jump over there, uh, click the worship uh, and sermons button on the home page, scroll down to the bottom, it's going to be on the right side and you'll see the midweek bulletin here. And it'll be a wonderful addition to our worship so that you can follow along with what we're doing. Also, as part of our service tonight, we'll be lighting candles. So if you'd like to, you could find a candle in your home and you can light it uh, during our meditation time a little later on in the worship service. We're pleased that you're gathering with us in this way tonight. So we'll begin with our opening prayer. Let us pray. God, we count ourselves lucky that you are with us today. We celebrate you and welcome you and ask your blessing on this time of prayer. Amen. God, you know us so well. You know we let our, our hurts and insecurities pile up inside of us, and we don't share them with you. We are sorry that we don't make a full and honest confession, even when we know what a relief that would be. Be patient with us, God. We are learning every day to trust you more and more. Amen. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. God, thank you for standing, for standing up for me. God, you're my God. I can't get enough of you. Christ, thank you for holding me steady as a post. God, you're my God. I can't get enough of you. Spirit, thank you for making me free to run and play. God, you're my God. I can't get enough of you. Amen.
So often in our household, I feel like I only ever get part of the story. We go upstairs and we've said to the boys, clean up your room. And they've said, we've, we've done it. And then when we go to look, it feels like it's not the whole story. Or, or we find them fighting with each other. We say, what happened? And we seem to only get just some of the story. We maybe hear the first half, but we don't hear the second half. What's interesting is in most of the Psalms we read in the Bible, it's kind of the same way. We hear about sin and we hear about transgression in the Psalms, but we only get the first half of the story. So often when we read the Psalms, we hear the psalmist crying out in times of great despair or challenge. Uh, these Psalms of confession, and sometimes they fit into a little bit of a different category, Psalms of lament they're called. They all end in very similar ways. And that's it's a statement of trust in the ability of God to forgive or to renew or to save or to otherwise fix the current situation. But our psalm for tonight, Psalm 32, is a little bit different. While similar in theme, it differs in one key way. You see, it seems that the psalmist is standing on the other side of the story. He's standing on the other side of having already received God's forgiveness and renewal. The psalmist speaks of iniquity that had been hidden away. But now he announces something new, something that he's found on the other side, which is grace. The psalmist tells us the second half of the story. He proclaims God's forgiveness and love and stands as a testimony to where the story goes, especially for those who find ourselves still in the midst of waiting for God answers. The situation of being waiting to be forgiven or to have your transgressions quite literally lifted off of you is what causes the psalmist to talk about a, a happiness that turns into a shout for joy. I guess a question for us might be, what is the issue? What is this iniquity? What is this transgression that is lifted off or is, or is covered by God that causes the psalmist to be happy? and to now shout for joy. What is this thing that's been covered by God? And here's the thing, we don't really know. We're not exactly sure what the problem is. Martin Luther, in his commentary on the Psalms, uh, points to what he calls pride, and that's somewhat of a predictable Martin Luther type answer. He's always had this issue of, of how we get standing with God and particularly of concern for him is that we think we can find that for ourselves, that we can make ourselves loved by God, worthy of God, based upon who we are, based upon our abilities or our good works. That's certainly not the only So often in our household, I feel like I only ever get part of the story. We go upstairs and we've said to the boys, clean up your room. And they've said, we've, we've done it. And then when we go to look, it feels like it's not the whole story. Or, or we find them fighting with each other. We say, what happened? And we seem to only get just some of the story. We maybe hear the first half, but we don't hear the second half. What's interesting is in most of the Psalms we read in the Bible, it's kind of the same way. We hear about sin and we hear about transgression in the Psalms, but we only get the first half of the story. So often when we read the Psalms, we hear the psalmist crying out in times of great despair or challenge. Uh, these Psalms of confession, and sometimes they fit into a little bit of a different category, Psalms of lament they're called, they all end in very similar ways. And that's it's a statement of trust in the ability of God to forgive or to renew or to save or to otherwise fix the current situation. 
But our psalm for tonight, Psalm 32, is a little bit different. While similar in theme, it differs in one key way. You see, it seems that the psalmist is standing on the other side of the story. He's standing on the other side of having already received God's forgiveness and renewal. The psalmist speaks of iniquity that had been hidden away. But now he announces something new, something that he's found on the other side, which is grace. The psalmist tells us the second half of the story. He proclaims God's forgiveness and love and stands as a testimony to where the story goes, especially for those who find ourselves still in the midst of waiting for God answers. The situation of being waiting to be forgiven or to have your transgressions quite literally lifted off of you is what causes the psalmist to talk about a, a happiness that turns into a shout for joy. I guess a question for us might be, what is the issue? What is this iniquity? What is this transgression that is lifted off or is, or is covered by God that causes the psalmist to be happy? and to now shout for joy. What is this thing that's been covered by God? And here's the thing, we don't really know. We're not exactly sure what the problem is. Martin Luther, in his commentary on the Psalms, uh, points to what he calls pride, and that's somewhat of a predictable Martin Luther type answer. He's always had this issue of, of how we get standing with God and particularly of concern for him is that we think we can find that for ourselves, that we can make ourselves loved by God, worthy of God, based upon who we are, based upon our abilities or our good works. That's certainly not the only option, pride. Uh, but in light of our current circumstances, it feels sort of fitting. You see, I think a lot of what's going on right now is, is we're all trying to feel in control in a situation that is completely out of control and unpredictable. And I think we're starting to find out, maybe in startling ways, the magnitude to which we have to relocate our trust in God away from trust in ourselves. So much of our lives is built around the things that we can control, things that we can manage. We build these protections around us to help us feel safe. But what happens when these centering things in our lives fall away? Well, then, as the psalmist speaks to you, life itself starts to feel very tight. It might even feel like it's being choked out. The psalmist recounts his own experience and how he groaned in despair. And then how eventually he had to hand this iniquity over to God. And there's power in hearing the psalmist talk as one who has heard the second half of the story, who has lived through it and now speaks to us who are still in the midst. There's power in this proclamation that there is something beyond the hurt and the despair and the isolation of today, such that one's life might be transformed by God's grace so that now, instead of hiding our brokenness away, hiding our hurt from each other, we might be empowered to, to name it and to hold it up to the light. And then the promise comes that when we hand these things over from God, when we hand these things over that we try to hide away from God, we discover that God is our hiding place. It's a beautiful turn of phrase that the psalmist gives us. God becomes our own hiding place, a place that we run to in our time of need. So what are we to do 
we who are still living in the first half of the story. The psalmist has an answer for that as well. One commentator puts it this way. In Psalm 32, 6, the psalmist summons the faithful to pray, not so that the Lord would deliver in times of distress, but to hold up but to hold up these illusions, these iniquities, this pride, and to give thanks because God acts to rescue. And this is what God, our God, is all about. And so I think that's our prayer tonight. Whether it's physical distance or, or emotional distance, whether it's pride or self-righteousness, whether it's fear and uncertainty as the moors of the world underneath of us come loose. The call is to stop hiding all of that away and letting it eat us up inside and instead to hold it up to light. Offer it up to God with a contrite heart and then together with the psalmist we might discover again our God of forgiveness and love, a God who speaks mercy first. And we might be gathered into God anew as our hiding place. Amen. Our worship will continue now with a time of meditation. I invite you to find your candle uh, use some of the blank, if you have printed the bulletin, use some of the blank space on the bulletin to write the names or draw pictures of your prayers. And then we'll light a candle too as a signal of our prayer and those things that we have to offer up to God.
We now invite you to join in our closing hymn, Tree of Life and Awesome Mystery. It is number 334 in the ELW. We will be singing the first three verses and then the verse designated for the fourth week of Lent. May God always listen to our prayers. May we always listen for God in the silence. May we live our lives trusting in God. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Share God's love. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.